Our last speaker of the evening is the director, director of Secular Therapists, author of The God Virus and Sex and God, introducing Dr. Dr. Daryl Gray! I've never had an introduction like that before, that's for sure. <laughs> well, good to be here. Thanks for putting on this great conference, you guys. You just knocked the ball out of the park. I really enjoyed myself, enjoyed the speakers and all. And uh, we got a lot to cover here, so I'm just going to jump right into it. The title that I gave these folks was the one you see up there, but the one we're really going to talk about here today is Did Jesus Masturbate? <laughs> that's what we're really going to talk about. <laughs> Get into that. I just want to put a little quick announcement. Thanks, uh, Mathisa, for helping advertise this a little bit earlier. We're coming from religion, and Nate Phelps, where are you, Nate? Nate is on our board of directors. We are an international organization helping people get out of religion. There's thousands of groups that will help you get into religion. We're the only one that will actually help you get out of religion. So, uh, as Aaron Roth told me just earlier today, and I'm stealing it permanently, Aaron, uh, he said, no longer is Christianity a chronic condition, you can fully recover. <laughs> All right. And that goes to Islam and Hinduism and whatever else you want to recover from. I also want to make a quick announcement for the Secular Therapy Project. It's almost less than two years old. We have over 148 uh, therapists and over 2,000 clients. People, if you want to find a good therapist that won't send you back to church, pray with you or get your chakras in your line, look at our website first. You'll find secular therapists that are well trained, use evidence based methods. So, to get us off to a proper start here today, I need to, uh, I need to get into my robe as I am the high priest of the Monster. Here's my straight monster. We thank you for sex and sexuality, whether homo or heterosexual, bi or trans, or for not making us like those uptight Christians. Muslims, Mormons, and Baptists. We thank you for wonderful masturbatory fantasies and for the pornography on which they're often based. <laughs> FSM, we ask that you have a sex partner as well as wives and husbands that know where our G spot, our clitoris, and the sweet spot on our penis is. Grant us long, lovely foreplay with deep wet kisses followed by huge orgasms and loving cuddles after. Grant us the courage and wisdom to communicate openly and honestly with our partners and give them more pleasure than we receive, for we know it is far better to give than to receive. <laughs> Your numinous, we do not need 72 virgins. In fact, we ask that you send no virgins because we don't want to have to train them. <laughs> Unless, of course, they're very willing to be trained. We especially plead that you not send any instead any repressed Christian virgins, male or female, for we then will only feel guilty and cause great problems with their abstinence only training. Your apostasy. We ask that you give us the wisdom to understand and appreciate our partner's kinks, or lack thereof, whether foot worship or ropes, talking dirty or spanky, help us to appreciate their full sexuality, and lead us not into the temptation and judgment of scorn for those for others when their sexual preferences are not ours. We do ask in the name of Raman for retribution, shame and scorn on pedophile priests, hypocritical ministers sleeping with a choir director, and gay bashing closeted ministers, etc. Oh spaghetti -o. <laughs> We ask that you send condoms and birth control in abundance and your many blessings to the many dedicated workers in the Trojan condom factory and Planned Parenthood. In the name of Dan Savage and Greta Christina, we pray, for they are the true gods and goddesses of this world. Very good. Yeah, we need a raw man at the end of that one. Okay, so today, tonight we're going to talk about uh, I'm going to we're talk about the key uh, role of sexual shame and guilt in religious propagation. We're going to show the power of male shame. Male shame is something nobody talks about. I'm going to talk a little bit about it tonight. I have a lot more to talk about in some articles I'm going to publish later this year. We're going to explore ideas for challenging shame and guilt and thereby undermining the power that religion has to hold us 
and last, to give you some tools, hopefully, in examining how religious shame and guilt may be affecting you, even if you're currently an atheist, for example. So to begin with, we're going to jump right in and look at the conceptual framework that I think is really important for understanding why Christianity and Islam, Hinduism, and others all work so well, but this one's going to be focused mainly on Christianity. And that is something I talk about in Sex and God, uh, about the toxic trio. You have to have three different kinds of belief to make, to make uh, Christianity the kind of religion it is. And I'll describe those in some detail later. First, you have to believe in an afterlife. A religion or a that doesn't believe in an afterlife isn't going to work too well with where we're going to go or with respect to sexuality later. Uh, second, you have to believe that there's a voyeuristic God out there who's watching everything you do. Now, this is not fatal either, because you could have a glorious God who just simply likes to get off while watching you have sex with your wife or husband, or masturbate, or whatever you're doing. And that wouldn't necessarily be a bad problem, because the third thing is what really undermines everything, and that is a God that believes there's only certain kinds of sex that are right, and you better follow it or you're going to an eternal damnation of some kind. You have to have all three of these beliefs, and, and beliefs have consequences. If you have a certain belief here, it's going to impact your behavior here. That's what Christianity has done. It's brought together a toxic trio. If you believe these three things, your sex life is now under the control of that particular religion. And as Greta Christina said earlier, it's fairly random what the rules are, but these are the basis upon which those rules are put together. So it's actually a perfect storm in, in Christianity and in Islam and Hinduism. There's a lot of these kinds of concepts. One of the perfect storm is that, first of all, it creates a death neurosis. Now, a neurosis is something that's out of the ordinary, an unusual amount of fear, something that, yeah, I'm not particularly interested in dying, I'm not particularly wanting to do that, but if I have an inordinate fear that drives my behavior day to day, that would be neurotic. That's what religion does. It makes you fearful of your own sexuality because sex is dangerous to your eternal health. Uh, you also have to have some kind of an apocalyptic or end times world view that this world is going to come to an end. Now, it may just be your end, but it's going to come to an end, and that sex is a deadly sin. Sex is a deadly sin in almost in all of the patriarchal religions. Not in all religions, but especially in the patriarchal religions. Sex is a deadly sin. Deadly in the sense that it will damn you to eternal something or other. <coughs> So, death neurosis is really an anxiety disorder. And it creates an elevated fear of punishment and death in, in the child. Beginning very early in childhood, you are taught you're going to hell if you think wrong thoughts. Even before you're sexual, you're learning sexual, uh, you're learning sexual ideas. And children, whether you like it or know it or not, you are being taught sexual ideas from the miniature infant. I watched my grandmother changing my infant brother's diapers. He touched himself while having his diaper changed, and I watched my grandmother slap his hand away in the most violent way. That is a sexual message to an infant. But it was a sexual message to me too, wasn't it? Those kinds of messages start almost from the day you're born, and you can't possibly remember that. It was there before your cognitive abilities were formed sufficient for you to dispute that. Uh, you know, it results in lifelong anxiety around whatever it was you were taught. In this case, we're talking about sex. And a fear of health and social ostracization if you violate whatever the norms are of your particular religion. So let's tie this all to sex. First of all, it creates great sexual anxieties in childhood and adolescence, starting very early in your life. It creates an approach avoidance in you. You want to have sex. You want to masturbate. But then you feel real guilty when you do. You want to have sex with your boyfriend, then you really have to feel guilty when you do. It's an approach of avoidance. And the more you get involved in that, the deeper the infection actually gets, the religious infection. So, what's the way around it? Come to Jesus. Go back to Jesus. I'll come back and talk about that in, in a minute. So, sex is deadly. Unless you do it as a married person, you're probably going to go to hell. Uh, don't do it if you can possibly avoid it. Paul said that. Uh, Dave mentioned or uh, referred to that a little bit earlier. Paul said, better to marry than to burn, but you know, if you can get away with it, don't marry at all. And I do agree with Dave. I think Paul was gay as hell. 
Uh, you can't do sex with improper thoughts. You can't be in bed with your husband thinking about that hot guy at work. That, that will send you to hell just as surely if you have sex with the hot guy at work. It doesn't matter in God's eyes. And women are unclean. And they're so unclean that 14 days out of a month, within, within, some, in, within Judaism early on, and within some parts of Judaism even today, women cannot have sex because they're unclean. Same thing is true in Islam. Uh, among the Muslims, women are unclean during, during the menstruation. And finally, you're always being watched. Now, whether Jesus is getting off while he's watching you or not, I don't know. But he's always watching you. So, religion sets an impossible standard that makes it certain that you will need forgiveness to avoid eternal judgment. And this is what I call in my book, uh, uh, the Dungarist called the guilt cycle. It's a fairly simple concept. You feel uh, some tension, you know, you feel a sexual urge, you engage in that behavior, you have sex with your boyfriend, you masturbate, whatever. Uh, in this case, uh, then, then you feel guilt. But what happens is religion comes along, and religion says, oh, but we can teach you how to feel guilty, and what to feel guilty of, and where to get forgiveness of. In other words, religion is saying, we'll give you a nice disease here, and when you feel bad about it, you come back to us, and we'll give you a fake cure for that particular disease. Uh, here's the way it works. You should do as God commands. Uh, when you break a particular commandment, then you've got to come back to God for forgiveness, and then the process starts all over again. That's why I call it the guilt cycle. It looks something like this when you add religion into the, in, into the uh, equation. You feel the tension, you masturbate, you feel guilty. Now what do you do? You go to confession, you read the Bible, you go to Sunday school, you know, depending upon whatever the guilt pattern of your particular religion is. Every, every major, especially all patriarchal religions, have their own unique guilt cycle. The guilt cycle of the Presbyterians is still different from the guilt cycle of the of the Seventh-day Adventists, and they're different from the Catholics or the Muslims, or the Sunnis or the Shia. It's even different within, within uh, many different major religions. So this is what we call the guilt cycle, and it's the perfect kind game, because it always brings you back to the place you got the disease in the first place. How many of you have heard of a Catholic confessing their sins to a Muslim imam? Has anybody ever heard of a Baptist confessing his sins to a, a, a Methodist? No, it doesn't work that way, does it? You only can get forgiveness for your sins in the place you learn about sin in the first place. In other words, you can only get some big cure for the disease in the place you got the disease from in the first place, whatever your particular religion was. And I, I could go on a whole talk about that alone. So it has a huge evolutionary advantage in that uh, religions that are particularly effective at infecting you with their particular uh, guilt cycle are going to keep you infected as well for longer periods of time. It creates a perfect psychological trap, keeping you trapped within that particular religion. It gives you the disease, offers you the cure, keeps you infected, oftentimes for a lifetime. So here's the unique thing about Christianity. And it is a very interesting religion because it has a unique component to it. Christianity is an asexual religion. Now, I'm using asexual in the sense that it discourages all sex of all kinds. I'm not saying anything negative about anybody who would be themselves asexual. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying religion, what we call Christianity, has a real thing for sex of any kind. Like Dave said, all sex disappeared as soon as the old, uh, New Testament was finished being written. And I'll come back and talk a little bit about that. Uh, Jesus says you shouldn't divorce. And if you do divorce, you can't get remarried. Catholic Church even tries to enforce that today quite unsuccessfully in some countries like the U.S. I said and talked about Paul Erd, Tertullian, one of the most misogynistic persons on the planet, is also one of the prime movers of the Catholic Church today. He's one of the gods in the Catholic Church. This guy said all sorts of things like, you, speaking to you ladies out here, you are the doorway of evil. This guy was married. Can you imagine being the wife of this asshole when he was dying? So the best Christian is a non-sexual Christian. Uh, and that's going back 2,000 years. Not having sex is the best way. And many of the saints said, many of the saints themselves were asexual or non-sexual or celibate, whatever you want to call that. 
We also see a lot of sexual ideas in Christianity. Virginity is a sexual idea. Celibacy is a sexual idea. We don't think of those sometimes as sexual, but Mary being a virgin, that's a pretty sexual idea. I think she was a sexually active adolescent myself. Jesus being born a virgin, that a, a virgin, that is a sexual idea. Uh, many of the saints were virgins themselves. Some played around and had a great time before they became virgins again. I guess that's what St. Augustine did. He prayed to God, help me become a good Christian, but let me finish screwing these three gals before I do it. That's pretty much the way he thought. Of course, he condemns everyone else after that for that kind of behavior, but he engaged in that quite liberally himself. So Christianity is a sexual religion. It creates a huge psychological conflict for the followers that can only be resolved through the religion itself. It can only be resolved through the guilt cycle I mentioned earlier. The key tools of this are shame and guilt. And I think it's very important for us to remember, no, what the difference is. And I'm thinking in terms of a continuum here, so if you're a psychologist and you want to argue with me about this, fine, I'll argue later, but not right now. <laughs> <laughs> there's, shame, there's guilt and there's shame. Guilt is very individualistic. You can feel guilty about something that nobody ever knew you did. But shame is oftentimes, almost always, communal. You don't feel shame about something until other people find out about it. Ted Hatter, Ted Hatter probably felt a little guilty about having sex with that gay guy in, uh, you know, Ted Hatter, the Colorado Springs mega, mega church minister who was doing methamphetamine and having gay sex with a prostitute in Denver. He probably felt a little guilty about that. He felt shame when his whole congregation got about, got about it. You know what I'm talking about. You know, you can feel shame about something that you're actually not guilty of. In, a, in Iran or Iraq, a girl who gets accused of, say, uh, kissing a boy may have never kissed that boy, but she will feel shame. Not only that, but her own family will feel shame. The entire community will feel shame. Shame is a communal concept. Guilt is an individual concept. Yes, I think we could argue about where it falls on a continuum, but if you put them out here in these two extremes, it helps understand why religion is so interested in both of these. And some religions are more communally based, as in Mormonism, or Islam, or early Catholicism. Others are more individual based, like Presbyterians, Baptists. And so the religion has to adjust itself to a shame or guilt cycle unique to its particular situation. If you're the only game in town, as say Islam is in a, in a village in Pakistan, you can get away with a, a lot, you can put a lot of shame on people, and guilt's not really gonna enter into it as much. The main focus of shame, however, in all patriarchal religions is on women. Women are the target of shame. It ensures that women are the most infected religiously, and it ensures women are charged with infecting their children Women, I know atheist women who send their children to church because they don't want to feel the shame in their community. Their community says, you should be teaching your children moral, moral values. And the only place they can get that is the church. And so they send their kid to church. It makes no sense to me. But I actually talk to atheist women who do that. Now, maybe their husbands object, or maybe if they're single, they, they need the support of their family, so they send their kids to, to Sunday school or church. Uh, and they, they feel shame if they don't send their children off to this. Now, it's also a root, sh uh, female shame is the root of Islam. It's also, I mean, root of Judaism, but it's also the root of Islam, if you will. Uh, women are seen as the tempter. They're back in the book of Genesis. Uh, women are slaves to their husbands, or slaves otherwise, as we heard David talk about. And women are unclean, at least for 14 days. So there's a huge amount of shame being dumped on women. You don't see that kind of shame being dumped on men in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Well, Christianity comes along, and uh, Christianity did one thing. It was probably a good thing. They dumped all the dumb rules, all the rules about shame uh, with respect to being unclean for 14 days and all that sort of stuff that the Jews had. It made it a lot easier to convert all the other tribes that they were going to be encountering throughout their their, their spiritual conquests, if you will. Uh, it's too difficult to, to, to conquer a, a, a tribe or to, to convert a tribe if, they're, if they believe something very different than you with respect to sex. So Christianity was actually kind of liberal about sexuality in the first century or two. 
I mean, how do you go to a guy, you know, let's say you're a guy and you've got four wives, you understand? You can convert to Christianity, but you've got to get, get rid of three of these wives. It's probably not going to work, is it? But if I say, you can keep your, you can keep your three or four wives, but your son here, he can't all, he can only have one wife when he gets of age. Okay, we've got a deal. And that's what happened. Because Christianity was, uh, it was a very poor religion. If you're going to convert the rich people, which they did, that's what they really want to do is convert the rich people, you got to, it takes a lot of money to support three or four women. So if you're going to convert the three or four women, you've got to cut up a little slack that first century or so. And that's what happened. Because there were polygamous tribes all over the area that totally surrounded Israel at the time. Herod himself was polygamous. Have you seen anything in the New Testament that said Herod, Herod was a bad person because he had 15 wives? Um, but somewhere between 9 and 15 wives Herod had. We're not sure exactly how many. Uh, the Romans thought Herod was kind of a pervert guy because he had so many wives. Not the Jews. Jews condemned him maybe for other reasons, but not for having too many wives. So, in the early Christian traditions, women were a really big threat to Christianity. Women, women are the only way to undermine Christianity in many ways, and I'll show you how that is. Uh, what if Jesus was married? That makes him a sexual creature, doesn't it? What if Jesus had children? That means him, he must have had a wife. So, that undermines some of the premises of Christianity right there. Having children, nobody, nobody, uh, how many wives did Jesus have? Anybody know? They, they you know. Uh, he didn't exist. We didn't have he had three wives. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus had three wives. Now you can argue with me all day, but I'm convinced he had three wives because that's what the Book of Mormon says. So, <laughs> but that makes him a sexual creature. Making him a sexual creature does a lot of things to the Christian religion that can potentially undermine uh, the whole the whole shebang. And it did undermine Islam, and it did undermine Mormonism. How many wives did, did uh, Muhammad have? How many wives did Joseph Smith have? Now, yeah, uh, about 50. Well, I've heard 38, but who's counting these days? So look at all these wives, and the children from those wives now fight. And so you see, in, in Islam, you get a split between Sunni and Shia, largely based upon descendants or non-descendants of Muhammad. The same thing happened among Joseph Smith's uh, progeny, whether it's uh, the guy uh, Brigham Young or, or Joseph Smith's own progeny. So you got to get rid of the progeny if you don't have this political fight. Now, and I do theorize about that. Uh, I'm not going to go into that right now. But just the fact that Jesus might have had a wife is a sexual concept. You'll notice uh, Christianity got rid of all these potential sexual creatures inside of it. So, where are the wives of all the apostles? We know that some of the apostles were, uh, were uh, married, at least two were probably married. Where's Jesus' wife? Uh, what happened to Joseph? What happened to the grandkids of the, of the apostles that were, that were in the Bible? Uh, I asked Richard Carey to review that chapter in my book. <laughs> he came back to me and says, you know, I really never thought about that before, but it is pretty bizarre. Why have all the women disappeared? Okay, that's explainable. Women were unimportant and all that kind of bullshit. But where are the sons? Because sons are always important in patriarchal religion. Where are the grandsons? Something happened in that first century, the late part of the first century, to eliminate even the references to those people. How is it possible to have 12 disciples and none of them have kids? How is it possible? It's not. We have lots of records of, say, more recent religions like, like Islam or, or um, um, Mormonism, and we can see those kids are there, but somehow they got edited out because Christianity is an asexual religion. You can't be talking about children without also talking about some sexual things. So let's talk about masturbation. A lot of people tell me, Harold, you talk way too much about masturbation. You <laughs> <laughs> talk. How many of you masturbate? I do. Okay. Oh, we've got a lot of liars in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Here's my, here's my reason why I talk a lot, a lot about masturbation. Look, if you don't have a good sexual relationship with yourself, how in the hell are you going to have one with somebody else? You're the first sex partner that you're ever going to have in this life, and you may be the last sex partner you ever have in this life. <laughs> so get over it. Learn how to please yourself. 
when, when I was doing therapy, I was a psychologist, when I was doing therapy years ago, I would have men and women come in and I'd say, well, you masturbate? Oh, no, I can never masturbate. Okay, how are you going to teach your partner how to please you if you don't know how to please you? That was one of the toughest lessons to get through people's heads. Where did they get the idea that masturbation is wrong? They got it from religion. You are not born thinking masturbation is wrong. You've got to find it out from some stupid idea about touching yourself is going to send you to hell. There we connect death with sex, starting very early on in a child's education. So, you have heard it said, Jesus said, you should not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He doesn't say anything about masturbation in there. But hey, when I masturbate, I'm thinking about that hot chick I saw in Playboy, okay? Or the one I'm working with. I mean, or the, if you're a woman, I know women do the same thing about men. So, you also notice, as we've noticed from some of our other speakers today, there's no prohibition against masturbation with women. It's not that in the Old Testament or New Testament that says, you, you gals can't get it on with yourself or even with another gal. And there's almost nothing in the Bible about men getting it on with other men, but that's, that's another story. So there's nothing about masturbation hardly at all. And yet, think about how powerful a message that is in our culture. I mean, it's so powerful that if I went to a Baptist church, tomorrow's Sunday, isn't it? We could go experiment here. <laughs> go, to, <laughs> go to a Baptist church, and I stand up and say, how many of you masturbate? I do. How many hands are going to go up? Or a Catholic church. Or a Muslim temple. Or a Hindu temple. It doesn't matter. Every religion has enormous prohibitions against masturbation, even though we know that 97% of them are masturbating, especially the men. I studied the great psychotherapist, Albert Ellis, and he had a famous saying. He said, 98% of men masturbate and the other 2% are lying. <laughs> Women, we know, masturbate a little bit lower. Maybe 70% of women masturbate, and the other 30% lie. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but here's what it looks like. You know, there's this all knowing God out there saying, don't masturbate, like he's watching you all the time. Now, I've got a question, and I think you need, this will be on your test at the end of the talk here tonight. Did Jesus masturbate? That's the, that's the title of my talk. And there's really four options to whether Jesus masturbated or not. Uh, and here's the four options for those of you who just leaning and made a breath about this. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. First of all, you never existed, so yeah, no masturbation there, right? Or he was conceived by Parthenogenesis. Now, that's a big word. Get your bi biology books, you'll find out that Parthenogenesis is having to be being able to reproduce without sperm. The only way Parthenogenesis works, it works among uh, reptiles, it works among some fish, there's a lot of species where there's occasional Parthenogenic reproduction, is it always ends up being female. There's never a male comes out of Parthenogenic reproduction, which means Jesus was born a virgin. Think about that. He was a woman. Jesus was actually a female if he was born of a virgin. Now, I'm just taking the Bible at its biological truth. I'm positive he was born of a virgin, so that makes him a woman. So he was hiding it his whole life. So that's number two. You know, and women, we know women masturbate, and he might have masturbated as a woman. He was biologically male, but he was asexual. That means he had no desire sexually at all his entire life. Well, what the fuck is somebody who's never been interested in sex his whole life telling me what I can and can't do with my body? That's just a question I would have of this guy. Or he was biological male and he was sexual. Therefore, if he did it, he did it perfectly. <laughs> talk about the roots of sh male shame. This is something I said earlier, no one is talking about it. I don't hear anybody uh, writing about this. But I think a lot of the violence that we see against women on this planet, not just in our own culture, but in almost all cultures that are, have a patriarchal religion, the root of, of that is male shame. Male shame about their own bodies, male shame about how they are viewed within society. So. Uh, men, when we talked about women's shame. 
Now I'm going to talk about men's shame, because I think there's a lot going on here. First of all, men are shamed for not controlling their women. In a patriarchal culture, the rule of thumb is to make sure you control your daughters and your wife, because they may go screw somebody they shouldn't screw, and then your property is going to go to the wrong person. So there's this property thing. Women, girls, daughters, wives, all belong to the husbands. So there's a lot of pressure to control women. A man who does not control his woman is himself subservient to the woman, and that is shameful in a patriarchal religion. When I was growing up, I, was, I still heard ser sermons in my church, which is a pretty conservative church, saying men, men should be the head of the household, men should control the women, women should be silent in the church, but it's all this ownership mentality around females in the household. Uh, women, men are shamed. How many, how many of you have heard guys saying you're a pussy because you can't take care of, you can't uh, control your wife? Or you're, yeah. I, I've seen that kind of growing up in my own community. Men who couldn't control their daughters feel it's shameful. And so the wrath of the father comes down on the daughter. The daughter gets pregnant and the daughter has a boyfriend and, and it's on the side. And the father doesn't know it. And it creates tremendous anger. If it's in Iraq, you get stoned to death. Because that is, that is what I see as a direct product of male shame. Males do not want to look less male among their male peers. It has nothing to do with necessarily with females, although females are very good at shaming males as well in some cultures in some ways. So, uh, men are shamed for sexual activities that are not procreating, such as masturbation. When I was a kid, anybody have this happen to you? We'd be in the urinal, and, and somebody would say, you shake it more than three times, you're a homo. <laughs> Anybody get that treatment? Yeah, okay, or worse, you know. Shake it three times, you're playing with it. Well, playing with it is masturbation. Only homos masturbate. That was what I was told in the locker room. There's a lot of crazy religious ideas propagated in the eighth grade locker rooms of schools today. And you can have an atheist child. You might bring them up as totally secular. You send them off to an 8th grade locker room, they're going to get a lot of religious training around sexuality. Now, it won't come out as Jesus said not to masturbate. It won't come out like that. But the lessons are still there, and they came straight out of Christian, uh, Christian propaganda at one point in time for that child. So what is learned? Men are encouraged to engage in threats and violence to control women. And we can see this really clearly in Pakistan. There's no doubt. Women are controlled by men and threatened violence, even life-threatening violence. But it's right here in the United States. The, the, one of the biggest predictors of spousal abuse is the religiosity of the, of the family. It's from a very fundamentalist family, and the man is part of that. There's got a high predictor of religious abuse. Also, the more religious the family is, the more probability of child abuse, both sexual and, and just uh, violence, physical violence against the child. So men learn to respond with violence or a threat of violence when women do not defer to, uh, to them. And we can see this in Orthodox Jews, in Islam, in Hinduism, Baptist, Mormon, it doesn't matter. All of these, there's a tremendous amount of violence or threat of violence or control of women through the threat. And that comes directly out of the shame that males feel. I cannot be seen as less than a woman. I have to be above women. I have to dominate women in a patriarchal religious society. And male identity is closely tied to dominance and superiority over women. Of course, the most famous of these came up earlier today, and that's uh, Malala, who actually tried to assassinate her, and there's still a fatwa out on her at this point in time. So the results are that men are very in very religious cultures or, or from fundamentalist religions are very prone to violence. We, we see that in the research around uh, domestic violence in the United States. A man's dignity is tied to superiority over women. Women are subject to threats and violence when not sufficiently def deferential to men. Men shame women for behavior which is seen as reflecting on men, like not dressing modestly. Your daughter doesn't dress properly, you shame her for it. Your wife doesn't behave herself at a party properly, you shame her for it. That's male shame. I'm ashamed of you. That's my male shame shaming you as a female. And then 
Women, men turn around and blame the women for the violence that was done against them. Because if you'd have just dressed right, if you'd have deferred properly to the ministry, you wouldn't have gotten slapped or, or whatever. Women then take and internalize this shame. Uh, and the shame messages are all over our culture. It's not just from the family, but it's, all, it's there all the time. And unfortunately, what happens is women then become the strongest enforcers of this. I don't want my daughter to get stoned to death if I'm in Iran, so I'm going to teach my daughter how to defer to men, to have proper uh, dress around the culture, because I don't want my daughter to get stoned to death. It's a reasonable thing, if you think of reasonable in terms of not getting your daughter killed, but it's still teaching the shame culture to your daughter. Uh, I would encourage anyone who doubts what I'm getting right, what I'm saying right here, to go get Candace Gorham's new book, uh, The Ebony Exodus Project. And our friend Mandisa back there has got her story in there. Candace's own story is rather compelling. And uh, Candace, I think, uh, uh, she's a good therapist, she's a good psychologist, she writes good psychology within this, but you're going to read a lot of stories of people interspersed with psychological examination of what's going on. So uh, I think it's a, it's a great book to read. Go get it, go get it and, uh, and look at it. Why I recommend that is because is, uh, what Candace has done is really shown how religious sexual shame, which is a lot of sex in her book, but religious sexual shame is such an important component of the black church. And we already heard a lot of it from Elisa already. I'm sure she could have gone a lot farther here today. I devoted a whole chapter of it in my book, Sex and God, because I think it's an important component to think about. Uh, so, so women, mothers, are the, are the main vectors of this religious infection. When you saw the video that Nadisa showed earlier today, you don't have to just see the video. 70 to 80% of all the women in a black church, all the people in a black church are women. In a white church, it's not much different. 60 to 70% of all the people in the church are women. Women get infected with the religion far stronger than men do because of the shame focus. Shaming them into church, shaming them to getting their children into church. There's a lot of shame messages that are coming at women, of course, and their daughters. And that's the most important thing. How do we propagate this to the next generation? Shame their daughters into it. And of course, it's the female's fault. It's the woman's fault if the children don't grow up right because the male is going to get mad about it and feel shamed and then he's going to turn around and blame them. The, the daughter or the wife or whatever. So it increases sensitivity. And what it starts creating is a lot of stress hormones in women, not, not just not men too, but a lot of stress hormones are created in these situations where violence could be the outcome of, uh, quote, disrespecting the patriarch, the male, or the religion. And so you see this hypervigilance start coming out within women raised in fundamentals for very religious environments. Hypervigilant, that means I'm always watching. I can never relax. Uh, Hina and I have talked about this in the past, some of that stuff. Even in her family, was pretty moderately religious. There was still some of that uh, going on. So stress hormones are developed. And before you know it, you've got uh, all medical problems, other issues that come out of a culture that creates this kind of constant need to be on your guard against potential male violence. Now, I'm not saying a male would hit somebody necessarily. All they have to do is give them a, a, a nasty look or yell at them. There's other ways of abusing people, and it's generally based upon the religious shame idea. So that anxiety then is contagious. Other children can feel it. Other children within the family can feel it. It's, it propagates, and it's hard to overcome once you become an adult. Uh, a male would feel, within that environment, would feel shame if he didn't discipline his daughter uh, because he didn't want the community thinking, oh, she's out there being, quote, a slut. My daughter's seen as a slut, so now I'm shamed. I've got to discipline my daughter for acting like a slut. And then males teach shame to other males. If you don't show dominance, you must be a pussy. You must be something less than a true man. And uh, as I talked about, same thing in the boys' locker room and Boy Scouts. I learned a lot of male shame in the Boy Scouts. How many of you have got male shame in the Boy Scouts? Oh, good. Okay, I wasn't the only one. Not good in the sense of that. <laughs> all right. So, all of these teach male shame around sex and masturbation. All these people, I'm getting ready to show you. Now, look at all these people, and keep in mind, they all teach male shame, but they themselves do not masturbate, okay? This guy doesn't masturbate. 
and this guy doesn't math, never, he's dead, of course. Uh, this guy never masturbated, that's Mark Driscoll, who actually said some famous stuff about masturbation in front of the mirror. And she, I don't think Joyce ever masturbated. Bill Graham obviously never masturbated. <laughs> and this guy, oh no, he did masturbate, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, at least for the gay guy. So, uh, how does this all apply to you? This is the most important talk, part of the talk. We've kind of set the stage to show how religious religion in, infects your ideas, your brain, with respect to your sexuality. But for 2,000 years, Christianity has been demanding that we become sexually pure. Well, in Christianity, sexually pure means no sex, pretty much. All the sexual ideas I talked about earlier. 2,000 years, our culture has been infected with a crazy idea about human sexuality. A lot of crazy ideas about human sexuality. All you have to do is listen to one of those preachers that Mandisa showed us earlier today. They're all they're preaching against sexual immorality. Well, I'm here to say our culture is not perverted by sexual immorality. Our culture is perverted by Christian stupidity about human sexuality. And it's, and it's time for us to take back human sexuality. It's not, it's not Christian sexuality, it's not Mormon sexuality, it's not Muslim sexuality, it's not Hindu sexuality, it is human sexuality. Human sexuality has a foundation all its own, totally independent of whatever religion you are. There are cultures out there that are very sex positive, where women are not beaten for expressing themselves sexually, and women don't go screw everything on the planet either. It's, there's no reason why humans have to be restricted unnaturally by these random ideas, as Greta Christina mentioned earlier, about how you should and shouldn't behave based on some invisible friend you have in the sky that would burn you forever if you don't do it. So, um, first of all, I think we need to proclaim that non-religious sex is, uh, non-religious sex is uh, not perverted. That's what they're telling us. They're saying non-religious sex is perverted. That's what Jerry Falwell says and Jack um, all those other guys I put up earlier, they decry that sex and sexuality is immoral, all kinds of sexuality. If it's not within the narrow confines of Christianity, it's immoral. And they tell us that we have polluted their culture. Well, I'm here to say we live in a culture that's polluted by Christianity. Now, that's unique to us. If you go to Saudi Arabia, that's a culture polluted by Islam. If you go to uh, India, it's polluted by Hinduism and Islam as well. But we are swimming in a culture that's totally polluted with these crazy religious ideas. And you, my friends, are infected with it. You may have been a lifelong atheist, but you still were in that locker room when they said, shake three times, you're playing with it kind of thing. So if you experience shame or guilt around your sexuality, you are still infected with the religious ideas. Now, that shame or guilt could be Muslim, it could be Mormon, it could be Catholic, I don't care. It's still an idea that got into your head somehow. And I'm going to suggest that we act like Christians when we hide our sexuality. When we act like, I don't masturbate, I wouldn't do that, I didn't have premarital sex, I'm not going to tell my kids about my premarital sex before I married your mother, or whatever. And we pretend that we didn't do something we currently do. I don't use pornography, even though I've got a whole stack of, uh, my dad, elder in the church, had a whole stack of porn. We discovered it rather early, of course, and visited his, his room quite frequently. Now, I know my mom knew darn good and well he had porn in there. But she forbid it. I'm not having porn. So when she caught us with porn, she made us throw it away. Which means we got better at hiding it, basically. Uh, we also behave like Christians when we let religionists uh, condemn us for perfectly normal behavior. If I see somebody talking, uh, uh, behaving race, in a racist way, I will, I will confront that. If I see somebody behaving sex, sexist, I will confront that. Because those are inappropriate behaviors around me, for sure. If I see somebody talk, behaving in a sex negative way, I think we need to confront that as well. Now, I'm not saying you ought to get yourself fired or create all sorts of problems in your family, but to the degree that you can do it, we should be challenging these things because the more we do it, the more we create sex positivity and get rid of negative uh, concepts in our, um, in our culture. 
We act, we act like Christians when we act ashamed of others, like our own children or somebody who's behaving in a way that's not Christian. We act, we act like Christians when we act like we don't use porn, for example. Uh, by the way, if you go down uh, I-70 in Missouri, there's like a dozen porn shops. I went across North Carolina recently. I put a cattle of porn shops. For every two churches, there's one porn shop. And that's with the internet going, uh, going wild these days. The uh, porn, porn people really love this because it helps advertise far better than that little sign. <laughs> so let me suggest that you might be a, you know, Jeff Foxworthy, and you might be a redneck. Well, you might be a Christian atheist if you feel guilty about masturbating. Think about it. You might be a Christian atheist. You're being like a Christian if you're feeling guilty about something that is perfectly normal. You might be a Christian atheist if you feel shame admitting you use, enjoy porn. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your children about sex and sexuality. There's no reason why you can't talk to your children about it unless you're infected with a religious idea. You talk to them about all sorts of other problems and things in life. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your spouse or partner about sexual fantasies you would like to try. Now think about that. The person you're most intimately connected with and you can't tell them your most deep, darkest sexual fantasies and secrets. Now I'm not saying your partner has to participate in those fantasies and secrets. Absolutely not. It goes back to what Greta Christina said around, around uh, consent. But being able to talk about it, and you can't even do that, there's something wrong with that marriage, something wrong with that relationship, and I'll tell you what's wrong with it, it's religion. Religion is getting in the way of you expressing yourself in a positive, healthy manner about what really turns you on or what really turns you off, for example. You might be a Christian atheist if you feel disgust around normal sexual activities. You might be a Christian atheist if you shame others, especially women, for their behavior. When I see on the internet, unfortunately there's far too much of it, when I see men, atheist men, using shame-based language, for atheist women, I think that person's still infected with religious bullshit. And they're not challenging that in their own head. There's no rational process going on challenging that. And I see way too much of that. So, I think sex is religion's weak spot. Let me tell you, if you're, if a lot of you are college students and you're gonna, you're gonna eventually probably get married or get in a relationship and have children. There's two ways to prevent your children from getting infected with religion. The first one is go out and expose them to lots of religions so they'll see that all religions are bullshit. It doesn't matter which one of them. So, expose your children to lots of religions. That's number one. Number two, and it's just as effective, teach your children positive sexual values because there's no patriarchal religion on this planet that doesn't use sexual negativity to infect you. Not one. Now we're seeing the evolution in, in action right now. You're seeing a rapid evolution among the evangelicals. Just uh, two or three years ago, they were condemning gays to hell. Now some of them are actually letting them in the church and not even making them repent. By the way, if you read the God Bearers, you'll see why that's happening. Those religions have to evolve just like any other virus has to evolve to stay viable in the environment. And that those religions are going to evolve in order to continue to be viable in this, in this particular culture. So we're going to see, within the next 10 years, we're going to see full acceptance of gays in evangelical churches. You heard it first here. All right? <laughs> Remember that. Uh, I want us to follow the lead of the gay community. I think my gay friends are amazing. They are not afraid to be who they are, and they're not going to let anybody uh, put them down for who they are. If I'm gay or I'm not gay, but that's what those, the gay community has been very straightforward about that. And they learned their lesson 20 years ago. Staying in the closet helps no one. So I think we should be the same. And I know there's a lot of people are talking about, well, let's come out as atheists. And I think, yeah, the more people come out as atheists, the better. But I think we also need to come out as sex positive in, in our day-to-day -day life. And when, some, when we hear somebody at the office criticizing somebody for being gay, I think that's the time to stand up and say, you know, I don't care if they're gay or not, or I'm gay, or whatever makes, whatever makes the uh, discussion move forward in terms of sex positivity. That's what I'm saying. Let's be positive about sexuality in our day-to-day -day operations and not let them control the agenda, because that's what religion, religions do. 
They control the agenda. They control the discussion. So be out about your sexuality and respect others about their sexuality. If you're, if you're into BDSM or kink, you know, within reason, I'm, like I said, I don't want you to get yourself fired or anything, be out about it. If you're polyamorous, be out about it. If you're bisexual, be out about it. I don't care what you are. If you're asexual, be out about it. There's nothing wrong with any of those uh, approaches to human sexuality. And the more we do it, the more we normalize that aspect of our culture and counter what's going on in the Christian community. It's actually the biggest challenge to religion is sexuality. So you can say things like, sure, I fornicate, just like a lot of religious people do, or sure, I masturbate. Don't you? <laughs> uh, sure, I enjoy pornography, just like religious people do. They just can't admit it. You do know that the two most religious states in the nation are also the two highest users of pornography on the internet, don't you? What are those two states? Utah. And Mississippi. Utah and Mississippi. Most religious. Let's normalize uh, behavior. Sure, I had premarital sex. Didn't you? Because we know something like 95% of all Americans have premarital sex. The ones that don't are Catholic priests, nuns, and Baptist ministers. Those are the only ones that don't have premarital sex. Do you believe that? Uh, or we could say something like, my sister had an abortion, and I supported her whatever decision she made. Or, I had an abortion. It was a good decision for me at that time. Let's not let the religious set the agenda around things like premarital sex and abortion. Those are, those are our choices, and it's a religious notion that you should be ashamed if you had an abortion. Uh, control of women's bodies is the bottom line of patriarchal religions. It's the bottom line of a lot of other religions, too. I don't want to get too narrow about that. And we need to challenge that behavior, and here's one way to do it. You could say something like, I use birth control because I like sex inside or outside of marriage, just like Newt Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh do. <laughs> this guy has so many sex partners while he was running for Congress, they had, his aides his, uh, had to come knock on the door while they were screwing somebody to get in and come out and give a campaign speech. That's from their own words. It's not... It, I'm not, it's not an urban myth, it's the, his own age saying these things. And of course, how many wives does this guy had, and how many lovers? I'm sure he had a hell of a lot more than he's owning up to. Just simply turn the tables on him. Do not let Christians put their people up as gods or saints, because they're not. Every one of those, I have no proof of this, but man, this is what those preachers up there earlier, was six of them up there, wasn't there, or something like that. I guarantee every one of those guys has been in bed with somebody who shouldn't have been in bed with them. And there's a lot of evidence for that. Maybe not for those specific six guys. I just have way too much evidence in my own experience. I, was, uh, I went to seminary. I know who was bopping who at seminary. And it was those theological professors had their pick, uh, oftentimes, of a whole lot of possible uh, targets. So here's some lines of inquiry. Just ask. Does your minister or priest masturbate? I think that's a legitimate question. They tell you not to masturbate. Why can't we ask if they masturbate? Does he use porn? Now, don't let them answer it. You don't care what the answer is. You're just trying to put the question in their head. Does your minister lust in his heart like Jimmy Carter did? Has your priest ever had an affair? You know, with all the stuff we see, it's pretty likely he or she did if you've got a minister. Did your bishop have premarital sex? Well, you know, 95% of Americans do. And this goes back to the 1950s. This data is solid. So anybody that said they didn't have premarital sex is extremely unusual. They're probably a pervert of some kind. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not a Christian. And, you know, I don't have to act like a Christian. Christians do all sorts of things. Uh, and I'm going to just show you... Yeah, this is the sexy part. I'm not a Christian. I want you to start thinking about who you are and your, and your sexuality. What kind of a sexual are you? Well, I call myself a secular sexual. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. And I don't have to act like a Christian.
take leave? <laughs> I want to leave you this last question, last thought, and that is... Are you masturbating now? <laughs> what kind of sexual are you? Are you still a Christian sexual, even if you don't believe in any invisible friends in the sky? Are you still a Muslim sexual? Are you still a Mormon sexual? Whatever you were raised in, there's probably elements of that. Just like somebody who gets the chicken pox has the chicken pox virus in their, in their self forever and it comes out of shingles. It can come out of shingles as an adult. You still have elements of the God virus in your system. You still have ideas about sexuality. You still feel shame or you shame other people based on ideas you got when you were young, a child, learning about the world from people who are themselves infected with religion. Let's not propagate the shame, the guilt, the terrible messages on our children or to other people around us. Let's try and break that cycle and, and learn how to be secular sexuals. I'm proud to be an out polyamorous person and I'm not afraid of it. I've got lots of friends that are polyamorous. We are finding each other. We're creating nice communities around the poly ideas. Uh, Greta mentioned poly earlier and talked about it briefly. But I don't care what you are, if you are into the kink community, if you're into the swinging community, if you're poly, uh, it, or if you're just plain monogamous and you love it, that's okay too. I do not care. What I do care is that we let people make their own choices about their sexuality, about their bodies, and enjoy that. This is the only life we've got, and I want it to be the best life you can possibly experience. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.
we do turn down about 15% of the people who apply because they just don't meet those criteria in one way or the other. Does that answer your question enough? I can talk more afterwards if you want to. Get online and read. We've got a whole article on psychology today, a great article that David and AOC wrote about what we're doing, and uh, it'll answer a lot of the questions. Is this one psychology? No, no, it's, uh, go to, go to uh, sectortherapy.org, front page, it'll have a link right to that article on psychology today. Yeah, Greta. So there's a few places that you talk where you talk about how certain sexual activities are okay because they're normal. Do you think that it's important to frame sex as normal, or do you think that it's more important to frame it as the question of who cares whether it's normal, is it ethical? Uh, great. I'll take, your, I'll take your side there any day, Greta. <laughs> yeah, if I use that term, uh, it wasn't the way I intended it. Yeah, it just blurts out sometimes, you know. I've been programmed too much. Sometimes I don't know. Good question, or good comment. Thank you. Uh, one, more. one more question. Yeah. Well, there are there are tribes. There's uh, the Na tribe in uh, in China. They're ostensibly Buddhist, but they're also uh, a local moon moon religion. Moon, they worship moon, and they're very sex positive. There's no word for husband. There's no word for uh, uh, for father in there because there's no such thing as marriage in that culture. Very sex positive. Women have full control over the sexual relationships. Girl turns 13. She has her own door to the compound. And she can invite anybody in that she wants. She can be monogamous or she can be have as many lovers as she wants. It's a very sex positive culture. Another culture of the Mangaeans in the South Pacific. Similar kind, not not similar in that sense, but very sex positive. Children, whenever children want to start having sex, they have sex. There's no prohibition against children having sex with each other. And it starts starts early and often. Girls, girls, um, boys are expected to give girls at least three orgasms a night. So every orgasm the boy gets. So is that pretty sex positive? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's that, there's there's a number of those. And before Christianity infected places like Hawaii and, and wide areas of of Africa and South America, there probably are a lot more sex positive cultures. Now, if, remember, sex positive is a relative term. You might look at some practices in that particular culture and say, wow, that's pretty sex negative, too. I'm not saying they're totally sex positive, but there are aspects that are far more positive than us. And females are not shamed for being who they are. In Hawaii, you could get your head chopped off for eating the wrong food, but not who you fucked. They didn't care who you got in bed with. You can, and you could be married and have other lovers. No big deal. But don't eat the wrong food or you are in trouble. Good. All right. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you.